thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to be welcoming you back to another lecture. Now, firstly, before I um, dive in to giving everyone a tech welcome, um, apologies for that introductory sound. I know it is um, not the best quality, but you'll be very, very pleased to know that as of next week, we are moving on to a brand new platform, um, which will resolve all of those problems and it will actually allow us to present our lectures in high definition. So you will have a much better experience from next week going forward, we hope. But as always, do keep commenting. And if there's any errors, we'll um, try our best to help you out. Now, if you are joining us for the very first time this week, especially a warm welcome to you all, you are most welcome. Now, um, these lectures are always free of charge for you to watch and to enjoy. Um, so if you see anyone commenting um, throughout this lecture, please don't click those links. Um, they're always free of charge. Now we do record these lectures and later on we'll be posting a link um, where you can watch our lectures, um, our previous lectures, again, free of charge. Now, um, as I said, there is gonna be um, opportunities for you if you've got problems to comment away, but do use that comment feature on Facebook as well to ask questions. So at the end of the lecture, one of the best things about these lectures that we will put your questions to our guest lecturer. So please do make use of that feature. Now, if you're enjoying these lectures, do make sure you hit that like button, do subscribe um, to our content and do share them. So if you're watching on a mobile phone now, please do click share and share this live stream with your friends and family. If you're on desktop, please do likewise. Now, um, there's another way you can support us and that's by making a donation. So we look after 356 historic churches across the country and you'll hear shortly from our chief executive, Peter Rez, a little bit more about our work. But there's a couple of ways you can donate. Now you can text CCT to 70331 and that will give us a gift of three pounds. And um, there's a couple other codes also, which I will post in shortly. Um, but also you can donate securely through our website, which is visitchurches.org.uk. Or finally, you can join us as a member. Now, um, if you join us as a member from just £3.50 a month um, by direct debit, and if you use the code, um, when you sign up on a website, there's an off code section. If you use the word lecture in capitals, you will be sent a free copy of this book, which is Beautiful Churches by Matthew Byrne. Sorry about the glare there, everyone. Um, it's a great book. Um, it's full of fascinating um, facts about some of our churches, as well as beautiful, beautiful photographs. And I know um, a lot of people have already taken this up on the offer and have really enjoyed the book. So if you've already got the book, do please comment away. Let us know what your favourite church is. Now, before I hand you on to our Chief Executive, Peter Rez, there's been so many comments coming in um, about a certain guest who makes a regular appearance each week. Um, and I'm afraid I am normally out upstaged every week. And um, it's been lovely seeing lots of comments about a special guest who always sits behind me. And his name is Clement. So for those of you who've been asking what um, his name is, he's Clement and he is an eight year old black Labrador, um, but he normally sleeps behind me on these lectures. So for those of you who've been asking um, and making pleased to see um, Clement, there you go, you have now met him officially. But I'm now gonna pass you on to our chief executive, Peter Rez, who's gonna tell you a little bit more about the work that we do at the Trust. But as I said, if you've got any questions or any problems, everyone, please do comment away or send us a direct message. Thank you, George, and hello, everybody, and good afternoon. Welcome to our lectures. Really pleased to see uh, those of you who are regulars coming through in and all of those people who are joining us for the first time or occasionally. Now, often I, I talk about the, the Church Conservation Trust to give you an overview of what we are. I'm going to try something slightly different today uh, where I am going to just let you know a little bit about us, but then I'm going to highlight one of our churches because I think what's really important is that you understand we have a collection of these buildings right across the country we have a collection of 356 and they're fantastic buildings we take on about two or three more every year as well but the but the trust itself was set up 50 years ago uh, with the express intention of saving historic churches that were no longer required for parish use and as i said we've collected 356 and we continue to do so but now our mission is really about how do we enable communities to use and love these buildings because we think they need to be relevant to people and that they're seen as an asset in the community rather than a liability. So we work very hard on making sure that these buildings are used and loved for a wide variety of, of events. Uh, obviously that's hit us pretty hard over COVID because those events can't really take place. So we've got something like half a million pounds worth of uh, a hole in our budget this year. Uh, just from, from not being able to undertake events in our churches. So any contributions you can make is very generously received and it goes towards supporting these fantastic buildings. Um, what we also uh, uh, 
are trying to do as well is, is get as many people involved as possible in these particular buildings and, and your support is really needed. So today I'm going to highlight for you um, All Saints Theddlethorpe. And the reason I'm going to highlight this particular church, I hope you can see my screen, uh, is that um, this has a fantastic rood screen in it. Now, talking to Richard beforehand, I was pleased to know that he's not going to talk about this particular rood screen, uh, but he is going to mention a couple of other church, uh, churches, Conservation Trust churches. Now, this is a pretty amazing church. Uh, it's got 12th century origins in the building, but it was predominantly rebuilt in between 1380 and 1400. And it includes a magnificent 15th century rood screen in it. Today, it was, well, in its day, it was, well, it still is sometimes known as the Cathedral of the Marsh, uh, but it is in the middle of nowhere. I was just speaking to one of our local guys recently, and he said that there's no parking within about half a mile of it. So it is really, really isolated and really, really remote. It's part of a Bats in Churches project where we're trying to look at how we can balance the needs of bats with the needs of ancient churches. And it's going to get a big cleanup because one thing that bats do is they poo a lot. And this church is no example and it's going to be cleaned up soon. But if you live near there and you want to help us out, we do need help with building the care of the churchyard as well. And it makes a little group for us with two other churches, one at Saltfleetby and one at South Summercoats. Now, the other interesting thing that I picked up about this particular church, and I'm sorry, I haven't got a picture of it, but in the churchyard, there's actually a carved gravestone, which looks like a tree stump. Uh, it's it's a, a very accurate re replica of a tree stump. And it's a, it's a gravestone to a lady called Rebecca French from the 19th century. And it was created by Thomas Wallace, who was a renowned wood carver from nearby Louth, uh, an incredible place. So if you're out in Lincolnshire, please do go and please do continue to support our work in these places. Now, today, you haven't come to listen to me. You've come to listen to a very knowledgeable uh, and well-written man, uh, Richard Heyman, who's a historian and archeologist, and he's written lots of books on lots of different subjects from river histories to industrial archeology. span And his, uh, his interest in churches and a church architecture is very long standing. And for Shire Books, he's published an amazing amount of work, including Rude Screens, you'll be pleased to hear. He's published on that, so I'm sure you'll want to pick up his book there. Uh, church Misery Chords and Bench Ends, something I'm very interested in. The Tudor Reformation, The Green Man, and Churches and Churchyards of England and Wales. I think we're in for a treat today, and you're in the very good hands of Richard Heyman. Over to you, Richard. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for that intro. I hope everybody can hear me. This is my first time doing a, a Zoom talk, so um, please bear with me if um, things don't go entirely to plan. Um, I'm going to um, share a screen with you so that you can, uh, so basically I can talk to the PowerPoint. And yeah, so what I'm going to talk about today is root screens, um, about uh, why they're important, uh, what they were for, how they were built, and who built them. And I just put up this first slide. This is one of my favourite screens, which is in uh, a place called Llan Anno, which is in the middle of Powys in Wales. And uh, if you look up Llan Anno on an atlas, you won't find it because it's... Um, it's a very small church where there is a farm, there is no village. Um, the number of people who worship there can only ever have been very small. And yet it has what you can see on the screen there is clearly a magnificent rood screen. And I mean, what this really shows is that um, in the medieval church, the screen wasn't a luxury, it was a necessity and that you can find um, extraordinary levels of craftsmanship in what would now seem to be like quite um, obscure places. So what you can see here, this is a church that was um, rebuilt in the Victorian period. And I often wonder why they bothered because um, there's very few people living around there. I like to think it was just restored because of the rood screen, and it is the best of the surviving Welsh rood screens. But you do find screens like this in very small churches, even in places um, without villages. So um, we may see, well, we'll see at least one more example uh, later on in the talk. 
Right. So um, I'm assuming that not everybody knows uh, where the Roots Green is or what it was for. So um, please bear with me, those of you who, who do know this. But just to give you some background, um, the church is divided really into two portions. There's the nave and the chancel. So uh, especially if you think of a medieval church, a chancel is for the priests. It's where the language is Latin and it's where the priests wear vestments, which is completely different to the nave where the language is going to be English or, or Welsh, depending on where you're living. And um, it's a secular space. People just dress in their ordinary clothes. So there are these two parts of the church. There's a secular part, the nave, and the sacred part of the church, the chancel. And the rood screen is the screen that goes between these two. So as you look in from the nave towards the chancel, you're going to be looking at the rood screen. When we go back to um, the origins of screens, most um, your average early church wouldn't have had uh, a screen. And there were screens that used to divide off the nave and chancel in quite early churches and cathedrals. Um, but most of what we're going to look at is, uh, is late medieval. It's stuff that's built in the 15th and 16th centuries. And there's, there's quite an evolution that you can see if you study early churches as to how and why um, screens develop. So there's always an important point, the, the gap, the, the, the change from nave to chancel as a threshold, um, and that's expressed by uh, the chancel arch, as it's called. But if you look at some of the earliest churches, I've put up there a picture of the um, chapel in Bradford-on-Avon, where you can see the, the division between, the opening between the nave and the chancel is tiny. It's just a small, uh, narrow, round arch. So you couldn't really put a screen there. You wouldn't really need a screen there because there's effectively um, a barrier between the two. Even if you look at a Norman church, um, again, the most important feature of the interior is the chancel arch. So um, that more or less expresses this sort of uh, symbolic divide between the secular and sacred parts of the church. And I've uh, just given you an example here of a church in Rutland, um, which just shows you the, um, the sort of ornateness and the grandiosity of the chancel arch. Well, if you put a screen there, you're going to sort of reduce the effect of it. So the chancel arch, um, where it's very richly treated, in a Norman church does more or less what a rood screen does in later churches. So when you get into um, Gothic period, you get the pointed arch. Um, the ch chancel arches get wider and the wider the chancel arch is, the more you need s something to put between the nave and the chancel to express um, that change of use. So that really is why the uh, root screen developed. Okay, so, um, so on the left, you can see uh, an example of um, uh, a chancel arch, a tall chancel arch from the 14th century, and um, it's filled with a stone screen. So the screen is kind of, um, it's, it's, it's really symbolic, isn't it? I mean, it's very easy to walk through um, the screen. What, what you can see there is, um, this is a church in Essex where there are, there are two churches which have got these kind of screens. The other one I think is called Stebbing. Um, again, it's just a, it's a stone grill and the uh, cross you can see there and the two figures, which I'll explain a little bit later, um, they've been added in in late Victorian times. But the picture on the right there is, is what some of the earlier screens must have looked like. Um, so this is a church um, in Hereford, uh, Welsh Newton. Uh, we can tell that screen is 14th century from the style of the arch, the way the arches are, are undercut. And if you look at the piers, they're octagonal, which is the standard form of, or they might be even be hexagonal, the standard form of, um, of piers in that uh, date. So if it was earlier, they would be round. 
if it was later, then they would have a much more complex um, profile. So what you can see there are uh, two stone screens, but you cannot see the most important part of it in the late medieval period, which is the, the rude loft. Okay, so I'm just gonna move to the next one. Okay, so uh, there are no stone rude lofts in churches that survive, but there are plenty of wooden rude lofts and plenty of um, wooden screens. So um, on the left, I've just got an example of an earlier screen, which is filling the chancel arch. Um, it's lost its loft, which obviously stood um, originally above it. And on, on the right there, you've got um, a church, which is a very small church in Herefordshire called St. Margaret's on my screen. That's kind of covered over, but maybe you can, um, you can see that. Um, so this is a church with a very narrow chancel arch, so it doesn't really need a screen, but as you can see, it's got a very elaborate loft on. And I think what's um, important to remember is that the concept of the rood screen is really a Victorian idea. If you go back to medieval times, they were always referred to as the rude loft. So it's the loft that was um, important rather than the screen. And the reason that the loft is important is you need access to um, the, what we call the rude group, which is the um, figures of the crucified Christ, the Virgin Mary and St. John the Evangelist. They're the three figures that make up the rude group. Um, uh, rude actually is a Saxon word for cross, if you're wondering where, where, that, um, where that came from. So, so the lofts were there to give access to the, uh, to the, to the rude image, which is um, high up um, underneath the chancel arch, we'll call it in a very visible position anyway. Right, when we, when we talk about screens, I just want to divert a minute because there are other screens that you get in uh, the medieval church, which are called Parklow screens. And um, these are screens that are um, where they screen off um, a private chapel. So that could be um, for a person who's set up a chantry chapel whereby they've um, endowed a priest and a part of the church to say a memorial mass for them after they've died, or it's done collectively as a guild. So a guild would have its own chapel and a priest to say memorial masses. Um, so these are often screened off. And you can usually tell the difference between a parklose screen and a rood screen because a parklose screen doesn't have a loft above it. Sometimes um, uh, the screens are built across, you know, the, the entire width of the church. So they're sort of uh, integrated with the rood screen, but a parklose screen doesn't actually need a loft, even though it's constructed um, in very much the same way. Okay, so um, I just want to look at um, screen structure, how these screens were built, and then I'll sort of go into uh, to it in a bit more depth. So effectively, um, you've got a screen which is partly um, open, it's partly a filter for you to see from the nave into the chancel. And it, uh, most of the screens have these uh, same elements. So at the bottom of the screen, I don't know if you can see my cursor, you can see a, cl uh, a closed part, which is called the wainscot or dado. Then you have these open bays, which uh, you can see through. And above that, you have the loft itself. Now on top of the loft, uh, sorry, yeah, on top of the, um, the screen, just hidden behind there is the loft floor. And here it's um, hidden behind uh, a separate um, image screen, which is you know, additional to the one at the bottom there. So um, that's basically how it works. And then above that, you would have the figure of the, the rood, which is the rood group I've just described. And then behind it, you have uh, a doom painting. And I'll explain what a doom painting is and show you an example um, of it in a minute. So effectively, your, your substructure is um, supporting quite a wide floor 
at the upper level. So you can see here that the, the um, screen projects out in front, but it also projects out behind. Obviously, the, the rear part, which, which the priests see, is less ornamental than the, uh, than the, than the front part. So effectively, that's supporting a quite a wide floor above it. So these two, good, because these two are both in Devon, but they're just typical of the Southwest England type that you find from Somerset down to Cornwall. If you go to other parts of England and Wales, then the screens are built slightly differently. So um, I've got two um, examples here. Um, the one on the left is, um, is a type of screen that you find in uh, the sort of middle of England, England, Wales border region. So this is an example I've got in Paris, but you can find these screens in, in Worcestershire. It's what we call um, a veranda screen. So the, the substructure actually um, is, is much plainer. And you can see that the loft floor is supported front and back on posts. OK, so there's the loft floor up there. And then you have um, what we call what well, the doom painting would normally there here. They don't have a doom painting, but you can see the cross there, which was part of the, uh, the rude group. Um, so, yeah, so you can find that those kind of um, screens in um, yeah, the England Wales border region. But if you go to East Anglia, then you find uh, quite different screens. Now, if, you, um, if you're if you a church crawler like me, one of the things you realize when you start to visit East Anglia, and I live in the west of England, but um, is that an East Anglian church is likely to be much taller than um, a church in the west of England. And for that reason, the screens are, are much loftier. So they still have the basic um, structure of um, a, a closed part of dado at the bottom and then open bays, but the, uh, the bays are taller and the, um, the way the loft is supported is a lot less ornate. Though obviously as it's um, much taller, then there's less reason really to spend time uh, ornamenting it because it's much further away to see. So, so the, the screens you find in the Southwest often they're more ornate because they're just because they're closer to the eye. So it's much easier for people um, to see them and appreciate them. OK, so I just want to sort of show you now in um, a bit more depth as to how the screens were organised and ornamented. So I've just got three examples here of the dado of a screen. And I suppose the most common form is the one at the bottom where you have um, panels which are sort of look a bit like a stone niche and again that's where they basically got the idea from and they have images of saints in them. Okay, that's probably the most uh, common form. Then if you look on the right uh, you've got something quite similar. Now Stanton Harcourt where this is from is one of the earliest wooden screens. It's definitely from the later 13th century and although it looks like plain wood now um, there is, you can see right at the end there, if you can see my cursor, you can see that there is a, a painted image of a saint there. But the reason I've shown this one is because it's got these holes marked in it. Now we call these uh, squints. And so the reason they're there is that um, the, the laity during the, the mass, they don't really take part in the mass. They are there basically as a, a witness to it. So most of the people would be standing around, sometimes they'd be chatting or whatever, but some people would be at the front kneeling um, by the, the rood screen. And the key point of the mass is the point where the bread and the wine becomes the body and blood of Christ. And that's what they call the elevation of the host. So during that, obviously it's all conducted in Latin, but a bell is rung at the moment that, that uh, transformation happens. And that's the point when everybody looks through the screen towards the altar at the east end of the church. So the squints are there. So if you're kneeling, when you hear the sanctus bell, you can look through the dado of the screen to the uh, east end of the church. 
Right, and the one on the top there is just um, rather sort of more prosaic. You don't have to have saints uh, to ornament the screen. Sometimes they've got um, things like vine trails. Sometimes they've got other religious symbols like passion symbols. Um, this is an example which has got what's called linen fold panelling, which was quite fashionable in the 16th century. Um, you're going on into um, Elizabethan times. So that's the closed part at the bottom. And then you get the open bays. And you can see by the design of that, that that's clearly based on the design of windows. So the tracery that you can see here clearly copies window design styles. And even though it's in wood, they've copied the, the style of treatment. So yeah, there's a very slight chamfer on um, these ribs that you can, that's very similar to stone. So the sort of language of the stonemason has been transferred to the, uh, to the wood card. Okay, now above that, you've got the coving and the, the cornice. And as I say, in the southwest of England, some of these are just fabulous to, uh, to look at. Um, the one on the right there, Carhampton, has been repainted. So um, although the paint there is Victorian, it does replicate the kind of um, very sort of brash, slightly gaudy uh, paint schemes that were common uh, in the Middle Ages. So you'll get um, lots of sort of banding of different colours on, um, on the posts. And then uh, you can see it carried up here into the arches and then a variety of colours um, in the spaces. Now, <coughs> the coving in a, a West Country rood screen is, as you can see, it's clearly based on fan vaulting. So again, it's copying um, the styles of stone architecture. Um, people, carvers in the Middle Ages just couldn't resist the blank panel. So all these panels are very, very finely ornamented and cut. And you, you see this. Um, you know, in almost every of these West Country rood screens. If you look on the other side, the chancel side, then it is usually left um, a little bit plainer. And then this example here, uh, lower left, we've got um, Lapford, again, very, very richly treated with this sort of low relief ornamentation. Um, the reason I've shown this one is because you can see it has many, many figures in profile. And that's what's interesting about that is that, um, that small heads in profile is very much a Renaissance uh, motif. So um, that just tells us that the screen is, is very late. It's probably, you know, it's clearly in the 16th century and probably quite close to the um, time of the Reformation. So um, above the cove in the, the floor of the rood loft is hidden behind these, um, uh, behind a cornice, which is multiple bands of uh, foliage trails. Now, in um, usually these are just different kinds of vine trails. And again, there's an incredible level of uh, inventiveness in, in carving these trails. You, you usually look at them and you find that, you know, each of the, each of the trails is, you know, differs from the one below or above it. They just don't um, repeat themselves. And then we've got this little picture of Clan Anno, which is the one I showed you, the church I showed you at the beginning. You can see a very common idea. The vine trail here is spewing out of the mouth of uh, a wyvern. You can tell that's a wyvern, not a dragon, because it's, it's only got two uh, legs instead of four. So that, again, is quite a common um, motif. But you can hopefully gives you an indication of the, the richness of the treatment of these um, uh, fronts of these screens. Okay, just a different way of doing it. Again, this is uh, this is a Shropshire, no, sorry, Herefordshire uh, screen, but it's again the sort of screens that you see in the England Wales border region, where um, the underside of the uh, the loft has panelling similar to what you would get on uh, a panel wooden roof. So the, the craftsmen who are producing this work are the sort of craftsmen who would have worked on uh, church roofs as well. So <clears throat> they've adopted um, 
a very similar style for ornamenting it. And you can see very commonly when there's an intersection of two pieces, there's a nicely ornamentally carved um, boss. Again, that's very common. And then you've got these arches and then these pendants which come down here. And again, a very richly treated cornice above it. Okay, so I was mentioning the, um, the rude group. Now, the trouble with the uh, rude screens now is that they've all lost their original uh, roods because of the Reformation. And I'll, I'll just say a little bit more about that later. But the, um, the figure of the rude group, um, um, quite a few of them have been restored in late Victorian times and, and later. Um, they were placed above the rude loft. So here, this is, um, this is a modern replacement. So you've got Christ, you've got the Virgin Mary, and you've got uh, John the Evangelist. That's the, uh, that's the rude group. Now, sometimes they were fixed to the top of the um, rude loft, but sometimes they were also fixed to what they call a rude beam, which is just a wooden beam, almost like a tie beam, um, which is fixed between the chancel arches. Now, I know there are some examples in um, Sussex of early churches where you, if you look closely, you can see where the rude beam has been sawn off. Um, and I know there's a church in Trull, uh, Trull, which is in Somerset, where you can still got a screen and it's actually still got a, a rude beam, which is very much like the tie beam you can see here. So, so most of these rude groups were actually would have been fixed to a beam above it. Okay. Okay, now I said behind, um, the rude group and sort of in the space between the rude loft and the chancel arch, which is an arch space, is this doom painting, which is the um, day of judgment. So there are, and if you go to, there's a church in Salisbury and there is a church in Coventry, Holy Trinity, which have um, doom paintings in situ, but this is the best doom painting that I know of, but it's no, obviously no longer in its um, original position. So this was set up above um, the rude loft and you can see the shadow of the rude group. So there's the cross for Christ and then there's the shadow of the Virgin Mary and the shadow of John the Evangelist. So what you're looking at there is a painted day of judgment. So these, um, these are done to a standard form. So on the left side are those going to heaven and on the right side are those going to hell and I always find this is a slightly disappointing because when you when you look at who's going to heaven it's all it's all the obviously the great and the good and when you look at who's going to hell it's just the sort of the peasants and common folk which um, I suppose just that's the way it is. Now a lot of um, these paintings the artists were much more inventive on the devil side than they were on the, uh, the heavenly side, and this one is no exception. So, so this screen was taken down at the, or probably sometime after the Reformation, because if you look on the bottom, you can see evidence of where the original screen was painted over, and uh, there were some texts put on it. Well, that was done at the uh, Reformation. And I think I'm right in saying the whole doom painting was covered in white paint. And it was found in the churchyard during um, restoration in about 1895. And someone scraped away some of the paint and realized that there was this doom painting um, underneath it. The same has happened with um, a lot of figures on rune screens that were paint painted over um, after the uh, Reformation. Right, I'm aware that time is going on, so I should be slightly swift. So above the rude group and the um, doom painting, you often have a more richly treated uh, part of the roof, which is called uh, a cilia, or sometimes people call it a canopy of honour, but I think that's more of a modern uh, term for it. So again, they were quite common and you do quite often see um, enriched roofs of naves right at the east end, and even if there isn't a screen, you'll know that there was a, uh, a screen there. Okay, so the, the importance of the loft was that you needed to, um, to get access to the rude group. So the rude group is set very high above the nave. And uh, the importance of it was that a lot of um, 
lights were lit in front of the route to honor the route. So they were either lit by people praying, they were lit on patronal festivals. Um, so, and they would be lit by um, people seeking penance or, or whatever. So there's lots of reasons for lighting candles um, on the rood loft. So you need access to it. Um, so sometimes that's with a ladder. Normally it's by a stone stair. So here you've got another Mid Wales church screen. You can see on the left there, there's a, a, a stone stair inside the wall of the church, which comes out here, which gives you roughly the level of the, uh, the rood loft. You can quite often see these, you can see examples on the outside of the church often because there's um, a little turret on the outside to make uh, a space for the, um, the screen stairs. So that gave you, gave you access to the, uh, to the loft. Okay, so I talked about um, the sacred part of the church is the chancel where the priests are and the nave is the secular part where the laity are. But of course, in a medieval church is never that simple. And a lot of screens had um, altars set up uh, in front of them. So sometimes these are um, uh, set up by individuals um, who've endowed a priest to say a memorial mass for them after their deaths. So that's like known as a chantry or they're set up by guilds uh, same sort of thing done collectively. So on the left there's probably the best example um, uh, surviving of, of how these altars work. So the altars that are there now are modern, but uh, on the screen itself, it was quite easy to tell that there were um, altars there because there's a blank part of the screen there and there are these figures um, set above it of, uh, of saints. So these were um, set up, you know, in more modern times to re replicate what was quite common in, um, in a, a medieval church. So here a priest would say, um, it's what's called a low mass as opposed to the high mass in the chancel. So they would say um, a mass for, you know, to say partly memorial masses, but also on uh, saints feast day. So people quite often just sort of crowded around the priest while they were reciting the lit lit liturgy. And you, you do get comments in, um, you know, contem contemporary accounts when they say that it's slightly spoiled by uh, people chatting about parish things while the priest is trying to say the mass. So they're all quite, uh, quite informal. Now, in the Middle Ages, altars were made of stone, but they were, they were removed at the Reformation. So finding a, an altar, a stone altar in a medieval church is extremely rare now. But if you go to this a little church called Patricia, which is in the Brecon Beacons, and it, if you want to go there, it'll take you a long, long time to drive up the lanes to get to it. It's worth it if you get there, because uh, not only has it got a fabulous uh, rood screen, it's actually got three of its original stone altars. Two of them are on the... Uh, against the screen and this you can see the one there set up in its original position. Um, we know it's a medieval altar because to consecrate the altar um, in a ceremony there are five crosses uh, incised into it, one in the middle and one in uh, each corner so we can identify that clearly that's um, a medieval altar. So these obviously were quite common at one time, it's very very uh, rare to find altars set up um, against a rude screen now. Okay, so I, I want to talk about a little bit about um, what's actually on the screen and how they decided um, who, what saints were going to be uh, depicted there. So we've talked about um, there's the figure of Christ at the top and the day of judgment and the, um, behind it. But below it, you've got the saints. So when you when you look from the nave into the chancel, you would see a whole host of saints, often the people who Christ knew, what we call the primary witnesses um, of Christ's life. Then you get a picture of Christ in the day of judgment. So a lot of the Christian universe is, is portrayed on the screen as you look through it from the nave 
into the chancel. Now, all rood screens were built by the parish. There was a, a Lateran Council in 1215 that said that the, um, the responsibility for the chancel it belongs to the patron of the church, which is kind of be the lord of the manor, but it was usually, um, usually a monastery. The remainder of the church was the responsibility of the parish. So the parish had to organise the building of its church and uh, the building of its rood screen. And that's one of the reasons why church wardens evolved, because you needed someone basically to, to manage these. So the screens you're looking at are all built by the parish. And the, the way they were built, they various ways of um, raising money, but a lot of the money um, came from individual donors. And often when this is the case, uh, they wanted them their, themselves uh, recorded on the screen there. So on the left, we've got um, a picture from the rude screen doors at a church in Norfolk. And you can see that there are two praying figures at the bottom. That's a man called John Baymont on the right and on the left is his wife. And they're basically praying that they're remembered um, after their deaths. So you will, you will pray for them after they've died. So the paying for a rood screen or part of a rood screen is a spiritual uh, investment. In practice, it took quite a long time to build a screen. You have to get the carvers to build it and then you get someone else to paint the figures and you know, paint all the ornamentation. So it's quite a long winded process. So very rarely were people actually donating money to um, individual um, to, for, for whole screens. It was usually for a part of the screen. You know, it's like someone will um, put money into for painting the saints or someone else for gilding and uh, what have you. Um, the picture on the right here is uh, a good example of another donor, Thomas Weimer, and uh, very often when they portray themselves on the screen, they like their namesake saint to be portrayed with them. And that's just a very good uh, example of it. So who was who appeared on the screens there? So we've got here on the left, we've got Ambrose, Jerome, who are two of the doctors of the Western Church. The other two are Gregory and Augustine of Hippo. And uh, they really are the sort of fathers of the, uh, the medieval church, and they do appear quite commonly um, on screens. Um, the other ones that are quite common are the four evangelists. Um, here we've got uh, on the left, we've got Tor Bryan, which of course is a CCT church. Um, these can be identified usually by their attributes. So uh, Luke is identified on the bottom right there with an ox and Matthew by the uh, angel. So um, the four evangelists, very common on, um, on rude screens. The other one, another one is here, you've got the archangel Michael, which is on the screen at Ramworth. I mean, I've seen marvelous painting, medieval painting, where you can identify him as a dragon slayer. There's also a picture of um, George as a dragon slayer on the, on the same screen. So this is all part of this rich visual culture. So instead of having a name written underneath, people can identify who it is uh, by the symbols that, um, that they're shown with. That's all part of this sort of rich visual culture. Uh, who else do we find on, on screens? Well, um, the 12 apostles, they were important witnesses to the uh, life of Christ. And of course they appear in the Gospels. Um, quite a few churches in Devon, like the example on the left, show a mixture of apostles and Old Testament prophets. Um, they tend to tend to go together. Again, um, I think they might actually, I think they're actually, they are actually named on them. Um, other curious figures, not all, not everything, not every person commemorated on the, um, or shown on the screen is a saint. Uh, this one on the right here, I don't know whether you can see that, that's uh, a Sybil. And a Sybil is a um, basically a pre-Christian uh, figure, which, uh, but in the uh, medieval church, they were, they were regarded as prophets who foresaw the coming of Christ. So they do occasionally appear on, um, on church screens. Um, all of which, obviously the, um, 
iconography of the screens is the responsibility of the parish. So all of these screens do show the sophistication of, uh, of lay religion in the late medieval period. Um, it's worth mentioning uh, female saints because um, obviously most saints we've seen so far have been men. Sometimes the female saints are grouped together on the, uh, on the screen. So here we have for Ailsham, they're grouped on the uh, left side of the screen. And that indicates to us that the women of the parish would have stood on the left side of the nave uh, during the mass. Um, quite common, the, the saints that are on it, the, probably the key ones, probably Margaret of Antioch, one of those, I'm not quite sure, that's St. Barbara on the left. One of them is those two is Margaret of Antioch. She was the patron saint of childbirth. So she quite commonly appears on, uh, on screens. And an indication that women obviously had a say in the, in the iconography of the, the screens. Right, so you get um, uh, common, you get common saints, which are what we call household uh, saints. So on the, um, the right there, we've got St. Apollonia, which is, sorry, she should have two L's. I think I spelt that wrong. Um, she was the patron saint of toothache sufferers. So you can obviously see her there with the pliers and the, uh, the tooth. She's quite commonly seen on, uh, on screens. And then you get uh, local saints. So uh, saints that have a quite a limited geographical reach. So if you're in East Anglia, you'll probably see figures like uh, uh, King Edmund, who was martyred. You'll see Ethel Drader, who was the abbess, first abbess of Ely. And I think her sister was Withberger, who was um, uh, solitary, uh, living in Norfolk. She's quite common. Um, here we have in Devon, we've got Saint Sidwell. Sidwell is uh, another virgin martyr. She was martyred by having her head chopped off. So you can identify her quite easily because she is shown with a woman holding her own head. I think there are other saints actually who were beheaded and are shown in a, a similar way. But yes, Sidwell, you tend to see in Devon, maybe in West Somerset, but you don't see her uh, any further afield than that. Um, occasionally, there are people who aren't saints, but um, the church wanted them to be saints. I've got, uh, I've got, so I've got St Edmund there, which I've just um, mentioned. Henry VI appears on um, a few screens. Um, there was a campaign to have him canonised, but it didn't happen before the Reformation. But he, he is a figure that's shown on screens. The other king who is shown is Edward the Confessor. The confessor was canonized, I think, in the 12th century. So he was effectively a, a saint as well as a, a king. And you do find him on the screen sometimes as well. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about um, what happened to screens because the uh, Reformation changed everything in the church. So um, most of the imagery was stripped away from the church during the Reformation, especially the um, the years of Edward VI reign between 1547 and 1553, that sort of time. Um, Latin was abolished in favour of English, so a lot of the sort of um, mystical aspects of Christian worship were entirely swept away. So I did show you that um, doom painting from Wen Haston, and I've got here on the left um, a part of the rude screen at Binham Priory. I think Binham Priory is English heritage, actually. Um, so this screen, um, you can see the figure of St Andrew behind. You can tell it's St Andrew because he's got this saltire cross on him. So at the Reformation, the screen was whitewashed over, and this is the text from the Great Bible, which was translated by Miles Coverdale in the 1530s. And it's sort of the basis of the authorised version that was redone in 1611. Uh, and I think this is quite a good symbol of uh, what happened in the Reformation is that the imagery that dominated Christian worship in the medieval period was replaced by the text. And it's a text in English, it's no longer in Latin. So um, one of the things that happened during the Reformation is that purgatory was decided, uh, was banned as, uh, as false. So the idea of 
purgatory, which is not in the Bible, is that you would have a period where your sins are cleansed before you could enter heaven. And during that period is why um, people would have to pray for you after death. So once um, purgatory was abolished, you no longer needed um, saints to pray for you. So you no longer um, had to uh, venerate them and you know, pray for their intercession. So uh, the way this tended to work is that um, the first thing that happened was that roods were removed and roods were, the reformers didn't like them because they tended to become objects of, they were more idols than, uh, than basically a, a rep representation of Christ. So a lot of roods, people bought clothes for them, they bought jewellery for them, uh, they put shoes on them, all this sort of thing that reformers didn't like. So they were swept away. The saints on screens, you know, fared a little bit better, at least in the short term. But the chief way by which they were um, eradicated was either by whitewashing at Binham or just scratching out the, uh, the faces. So if you go to uh, churches in East Anglia, a lot of the screens like this one on the right, you can see faces that are scratched out. Um, I think, I'm not sure whether, I don't know whether anyone really knows whether this happened in the 1540s when um, the cult of saints was banned and images were required to be removed or whether it happened in the civil war because there was another bout of uh, iconoclasm during the civil war in 1640s and there was a, uh, uh, Parliamentary uh, General William Dowsing, who was a very um, zealous uh, iconoclast working in Suffolk and Norfolk. So what you're looking at there could be the 1540s, it could be his work in the uh, 1640s. Okay, there was what we call the uh, Marian reaction. So when Queen Mary assumed the throne in 1553, she wanted to reinstate the Catholic worship. Um, unfortunately, Every parish had had to spend so much money getting rid of um, their existing paraphernalia of worship that they couldn't, they didn't have the money to restore all their roods. So this is, um, this is the only example I know of, um, instead of having a new rood group carved, um, in, in place of the doom painting, there's a painting of the rood group, which was done in the 1550s. If you go to this church, this is Ludham in Norfolk, if you go there and you go into the chancel, to look at the other side of that screen, it shows the arms of Queen Elizabeth. So I think in 1558, when Elizabeth came to the throne, they may have just turned that one round, so the arms of Elizabeth were facing the front. Okay, so rude screens were not um, abolished at the Reformation. Um, usually the roods were and eventually the rude lofts were because um, if you remove the rude loft then it's much harder to reinstate the rude and to, and to light candles before it. So a lot of screens lost their lofts but the idea of a, um, a symbolic barrier between the nave and the chancel um, continued. So you've got here, I've got two examples here from the early, uh, from the 17th century. So Abbey Door, which was a, um, a monastery that went to the parish <coughs> at the Reformation. There's a screen from the early 17th century. And instead of having a rude group on it, you can see it's got the um, arms and that's the royal arms there, I think of James I. And then you've got this uh, church in Staffordshire, Ingestra, I don't know, Ingestra, I don't know how you pronounce it. Uh, this is a, a Christopher Wren church, actually, one of the few he built outside of London. And it's got a screen by Grinling Gibbons, which again, instead of having a rude group on it, it's got the uh, royal arms of Charles II on it. Okay, then there's this issue of uh, restoration. So um, it's easy to assume that um, you know, in the Georgian church, which, you know, liked plainness, it wasn't very ornamental, um, screens may have suffered, but when the Victorians came and they were much more interested in the Middle Ages, that screens um, uh, had a, pe pe a, pe a period when they were um, restored again. That's not quite uh, what happened. So a lot of Victorian architects 
didn't like screens and they got rid of them. So for, for two reasons, one, quite often when you go into a church, the, um, the focus of it, if you're standing in the nave, is the glass in the east window. And they like that view straight through past the altar to the window. So if you have a screen that's got in the way of it. So a lot of screens were removed on that basis. The other thing they did was in to um, <clears throat> sort of accentuate the sacred part of the church. They set the chancel on a higher level. So there are steps between the nave and the chancel. And once you've got steps in, then you, um, the, the screen is kind of in the way. So a lot of Victorian architects just got rid of screens. And I know that surprises a lot of people. There were architects like Gilbert Scott who quite liked screens and he made he made a lot of screens himself and he some of them were actually in wood, some of them were in uh, cast and wrought iron. Um, but yes, a lot of architects got rid of them until the end of the century when there's a little bit more interest in, uh, in preserving them. So this is done in two ways. Firstly, on the left here, this is an example of the uh, a rude group which has been restored and, and they put underneath it uh, a cilia which is very similar to what you had in the, um, you could see in medieval churches. And then on the, uh, the right side, um, just an example of the work of an architect called Sir Ninian Comper. So Comper was working from the late Victorian period right well into the 20th century. And uh, he did a lot of work uh, on screens, either restoring old screens, um, embellishing the, you know, making new rude groups for them, uh, he also built uh, his own screen. So this screen at Lund, which I can't remember if that's Norfolk or Suffolk, but it's clearly influenced by the screen that I showed you earlier at uh, Ranworth, which has got um, <coughs> altars with it, and then these large figures behind um, the altar. And then you can see this great uh, ornamentation of what's effectively just a symbolic rood loft. I don't think there's effectively um, a rood loft to it. So Comper, he, he was an architect, and that's significant in the sense that um, all the medieval examples were, I've shown you were built by carvers, but from the 19th century onwards, uh, design for screens came under the auspices of the, uh, the architect. So essentially, this is an architect-led uh, revival, as well as some restorers in the 20th century. So if you want to see um, a, a a large screen by Ninian Comper. Lund is, is a good example. The other one is uh, Wellingborough. One is two churches in Wellington, St Mary, which he uh, designed and built himself. That's also got its own, um, own root screen. Okay, so I think I've gone through um, all of my slides now. I'm not quite sure how we are for time, but um, I don't know whether George is going to come in and there's going to be some questions asked. Uh, thank you so much, Richard. That was fascinating. And uh, I'd just say, you know, we've got over 800 people live and there have been um, almost 300 comments coming in. And um, just thank you so much for taking time to talk to us. And thank you everyone for your questions coming in. So um, we always have time at the end of a lecture for some questions. So I'm going to um, Due to time, everyone, I'm going to have to keep it a little bit short, so I'm going to try and allot 10 minutes for questions today. Um, so if I can't get through all of them, I'm sorry, but we will come, come back to you. We'll try and find answers for you. Now, um, Peter said at the start of this lecture that Richard's written several books, and I'm afraid I haven't got the third one, but I've got two of them right in front of me. Um, particularly Richard's book on root screens, so the subject of today's one, but also on churches and churchyards of England and Wales. Now, very shortly, you will be able to buy these books on the CCT website. Now, if you'd like to express interest in buying or pre-ordering um, these books, um, do send us a direct message to our Facebook and we'll let you know um, once they're on our website. Otherwise, um, we will be um, just commenting on Facebook when we've got the books for sale. Now, talk about books. Also, we've got, um, if you join us, as I said, by direct debit, and if you use the code lecture and use it in capitals, we will send you a free copy of this book, um, which is Beautiful Churches by Matthew Burns. So um, if you have enjoyed this free lecture, um, please do consider supporting us by becoming a member or by uh, making a donation. 
finally, and I'm afraid this is another book one, um, next week we're going to be joined by Alec Hamilton, who will be talking about lost arts and crafts churches. Now, Dr. Hamilton has recently published um, this book, um, Arts and Crafts Churches. Um, it's the first book on arts and crafts churches in Britain. So it's a wonderful, wonderful volume talking about arts and crafts churches. And it really is full of fantastic um, images. Don't know if you can see here, this is the beautiful Watts Memorial Chapel um, down in Surrey. Um, normally this sells for 45 pounds, recommended retail price, um, but we're selling it on the CCT website for 35 pounds plus post and packaging. And um, we'll comment a link. So if you'd like to buy this in advance um, of next week's lecture, it's not really posted, I'm afraid, till after the lecture, but if you'd like to get your copy, we've got a limited amount in stock so please do buy them through our website um as i said we'll post a link and that's as i said 35 pounds plus post and packaging now we're going to dive straight into questions so thank you everyone for um all your questions coming in um so i'm gonna dump ju or jump straight in here um would um so you've talked um about the doom paintings and there's been a couple of questions here do doom paint, are there more surviving doom paintings in England than there are rude screens, or are there more rude screens than there are doom paintings? Any more rude screens, yeah. Doom paintings, you've got Wen Haston, Coventry, um, Salisbury, and there might be one or two others, and that's about it. You do find um, <clears throat> some early churches like uh, in Sussex, Coombs and Clayton have painted figures of, of Christ on the east wall. Of the nave, whether they're quite doom painted, because you only you only see them in a frag, frag, fragmentary form. Um, whether they're actually doom paintings or not, I don't know. But yes, no doom paintings. Sadly, because um, they're a lot of fun to look at. But yeah, no, they're not they're not very common at all. Excellent. And at the start, actually, we talked about um, architectural styles of churches. So particularly, you mentioned in the West Country, um, churches were not as tall as those in East Anglia. Um, someone's asked the question, are there any particular styles or stylistic features associated with rude screens in the north of the country? Well, the north of the country's got a lot less screens in it, I'm afraid. Um, and um, partly, I suppose, because the north of England um, you know, was much more sparsely inhabited, so there are less ch churches to choose from. I mean, you probably find Norfolk's got more churches in it than Lancashire, Northumberland, Cumbria, and Co. put together. I mean, it's just a huge because that's where everybody, that's where everybody lived. So, so yeah, no. So the screens in the north, there's no particular, um, no partic particular style. Thanks, Richard. And uh, an interesting question. We've had quite a few similar questions on this theme, but. Were parts of any of the services held on a rude screen or were they only for lighting candles or any kind of musical activity? Yeah, okay. so you have, um, you have singers, you know, the choir would be on the screen, on the loft. Um, there's quite a few cases of um, the organ, the original organ being on the loft. Um, sometimes there's an altar on the loft, like you have against the screen, sometimes there's some in the loft. And during the... Um, uh, during the Easter ceremonies, Good Friday, I think, um, sometimes they sang the gospel from the loft. So yeah, so they were used and they were used by the clergy as well as the lay folk as well. But a lot of it, yeah, is lighting candles and um, I think mystery plays could be performed there as well. Thanks, Richard. And one of the things I think that's quite interesting, and you touched on it um, with certain figures and you talked about um, the Virgin Mary often accompanying um, Christ along with um, John the Baptist, or sorry, John the Evangelist. Um, mm -hmm. are, on the continent, someone's mentioned that, that you can sometimes find the um, two thieves, so the criminals who were crucified Christ. Was that common in England to find other figures apart from the Virgin Mary and St. John? Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think because there's, um, <clears throat> there's part of a screen base at Columpton where you can see the socket where they put the rude, the, the, the uh, rude group into and uh, it's what's called a Golgotha in other words it's got the um, it's meant to re replicate the hill that Christ was cru crucified on and you can see it's got skulls around the ground so uh, it might be that the two thieves were occasionally shown but not not normally in a rude group no but and you, you, talking sort of you know, we talked about the north of England and someone's asked um are there any sort of examples? Was it commonplace to have rude screens in Ireland or um, in Scotland at all as well? 
Yeah, Ireland, I'm not really an expert on. Um, Scotland, <clears throat> um, again, I'm not really an expert on, partly because it had its own reformation and because of its um, history, it's lost a lot of its medieval buildings. So churches in Scotland tend to be later. So <clears throat> I'm sure there is an answer to that, but we'll probably have to look elsewhere for it. No, I, I, and that's really great. And the um, we talked about um, how you said that the the division between the chancel sort of look, being looked after maybe by a local manor or by the local monastery, and yeah. the nave being the responsibility for the parishioners, and yeah. that rood screens were paid for by um, the parishioners of that parish. By extension, does that mean that the upkeep and sort of any redecoration of the rood screen was also paid for um, yeah. by the parish? Yeah, the whole church was. You know, the church tower, the nave, the aisles. Yeah, they're all built by the church people themselves and organised by the church wardens, yeah. And is there a, any example um, that you can think of where um, there's been multiple root screens in a parish where they've been taken out to make adaptations for, you know, architectural style? So maybe the movement from Romanesque architecture into Gothic? Uh, I don't know of any, there's, I don't know of any screens of that, uh, of that day in a, a parish church, no. And I think we've got time maybe for two more questions, and this one's a bit of a um, uh, more of a theological one, but does the rood screen have any relationship to the iconostasis in a Greek Orthodox church? I don't know. No? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and um, finally, I think this is a nice question to finish on, but do you have a favourite rood screen in England or Wales? I think I've um, got several favourites. Um, Barton Turf, very rich screen in Norfolk. I always enjoy going there. Uh, Flanano, which I've shown you, which isn't actually that far from where I live. I've been there loads of times and take a photo every time I go. Um, <clears throat> in the southwest of England, um, I think in um, Sand Creed and St. Levin in Cornwall. So, I mean, but there are just loads to choose from. Loads there are. And I have to say, again, um, thank you so much, uh, Richard, for your presentation today and your lecture. Um, it's for a lot of us who are in lockdown, these lectures have been a great source of inspiration. I know a lot of us are looking forward to getting back out and church crawling when we're able to. So your lecture today has certainly given us lots of churches to go and inspect and look at some root screens. Thank you very much um, for your lecture today. Um, I think that's about all the time we've got for today, um, everyone. So um, I'm sorry that we've had to cut it a bit short. For I know there were lots of questions that came, but I will do, do my best to get back to all of those questions. But if you've got ideas or suggestions for future lecture topics, please do drop us a line. You can send us a message um, or do comment away on the stream. As I said, do join us next week where we'll be looking at lost arts and crafts churches. So we've got some really interesting designs for churches that were designed but were never built. And um, you're, for the first time, um, we're going to be sharing with you some really wonderful architectural drawings. So do join us next week for that talk. Um, but again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you so much, Richard, for taking time to give us this lecture today. Take care, everybody.